But I'm going to be talking mostly about how to make advanced care planning easier. And sort of spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you up front sort of what my conceptualization of advanced care planning is. And I think one of the exciting things about this field is it actually is evolving over time. Um, so for a long time, advanced care planning only meant completing an advanced directive. Um, but as you can see from the 2004 IOM report um, on death and dying in America, the advanced care planning definition is a process that can start at any age or state of health, should involve family members and clinicians, discussions should center on life values and goals over time, become increasingly specific as illness progresses, and advanced directives are useful when they're a component of comprehensive discussions. And so I just put this up here to kind of frame sort of where I'm at in terms of my thinking, and it aligns with the IOM report. But I think more importantly to kind of frame what I'm going to be talking about, there's this conceptualization from respecting choices that talks about advanced care planning in terms of, oh, I'm supposed to say that I don't have anything to disclose. <laughs> so I wish, that I, I wish that I did, but I don't. Um, but in terms of this sort of conceptualization of advanced care planning, they talk about sort of first steps, next steps, and last steps. And normally when they talk about that, they talk about it in terms of the life course. So you might have a different conversation with someone who's healthy in the first steps versus a conversation in the last steps. But I actually also think of it in terms of readiness. Because somebody could have terminal cancer, but still be in the first steps in terms of being able or willing um, to have these conversations. And so my work has really focused on first steps. And so that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about today. Um, so why is advanced care planning so hard? Um, thoughts from the audience? Why is it hard to have these conversations? I don't know. Maybe you're all experts and it's really easy for you. I don't know. But we don't like talking about death. Right. No, don't like talking about death. Scary for a lot of people. Scary for a lot of people. Takes time. Takes time. family doesn't want to listen to us all. It's kind of like scary. It takes too much time, all of these things. Um, so today, what I want to talk about is really to describe the problems with that traditional view of advanced care planning that sort of focuses mostly on advanced directives, but then very quickly try to get to providing an alternative objective to advanced care planning that focuses on preparation for decision making, and then how to make advanced care planning easier for us and our patients. So for the clinician, for the patients and the surrogate, and then if we have time, and I'll keep my eye on the clock, um, documentation. I heard there was a Warriors game tonight, so I'll try to be snappy. Um, and I just want to say that I think that a lot of this comes back to patient stories. And again, I know I'm speaking to the choir here. But I think oftentimes when we focus on checkboxes and things, we sort of lose who the patient is. And so I think throughout what I'm going to be talking about, I'm just going to keep coming back to stories. So what's the traditional objective of advanced care planning, right? It's been to have patients make treatment decisions in advance of serious illness in an attempt to provide care that's consistent with their goals. And by treatment decisions, I would say that advanced care planning for a long time was really only focused on whether somebody wanted CPR or mechanical ventilation. And we've used advanced directives and pulse forms. And I think the thing is that clinicians and lawyers really sort of like the checkbox. I like the checkbox. You do the checkbox and you're kind of done and we can just sort of be done with this. And are you DNR, DNI, yes or no? And then we can just sort of move on from here. Um, and the thing is, advanced directives are helpful. So studies have shown that they can help. So there was a study by Joan Tino um, a while ago now, in 2007, that showed if somebody had an advanced directive, there was better communication between the surrogate and the doctor but there was still a lot of stress for the surrogate and a lot of uncertainty on their part. There was a sort of landmark study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 that was showing that if somebody had an advanced directive, they were sort of more likely to get the care that they wanted, but in like the last days of life. And I think the question that I have is, well, I'm a geriatrician, and patients basically are making millions of decisions in their family over time, months if not years, and so do these things really help people over time and not just really in the last days? 
That to say, I'm a huge proponent of advanced directives and I actually created one. So for people that don't know, um, this is an advanced directive we created for California about 10 years ago. It's written at a fifth grade reading level. It contains pictures. It's been translated into 10 different languages and it's free. And on top of that, it's evidence-based. So we actually did a randomized control trial at San Francisco General Hospital. And among English and Spanish speakers, we found it was overwhelmingly preferred. There was inc you know, increased uh, six-month completion rates, basically doubled from baseline. There was only one person that filled out the harder form. And that's great, but, you know, and this is, uh, you know, I was going to say that that's great, but the problems if you're focusing just on advanced directives are that they're not always available when needed. I think POLST and the EMRs may be helping that, but I can tell you we just had, you know, something on ethics committee just last week that sort of the same thing is sort of coming up. Um, studies have shown that just the form itself without a discussion really doesn't improve people's knowledge, doctors or their surrogate decision makers more than chance. Um, you know, there have been some studies that show that just having the form does affect cost, especially in high sort of cost areas, but there have been a lot of studies that show that they don't. And as I was saying before, they don't always prevent surrogate stress. So problems with only advanced directives, as I was saying, is that these forms usually only focus on CPR, even though there are a lot of other decisions. There was this crazy story in Canada that looked at 12 hospitals that actually showed that 70% of the time, end of life decisions were either missing or wrong in the medical chart. So even if you have them, that doesn't mean that they're up to date or they're what the person wants. And the forms themselves, in and of themselves, they don't really prepare people for this ongoing decision making that they might have to do. And again, the question is, are advanced directives enough? And so I'm going to read you a quote from one of our focus groups. And throughout the course of this talk, you'll hear a couple of these quotes. Um, and this was from a surrogate decision maker that said, we got the DNR in writing, but in making the decisions, which there were many, that was just one because the first decision was to put him in a nursing home. We were married 30 years and I could no longer take care of him. Then the second decision was whether to put him on a feeding tube because he had stopped eating and I wasn't ready to let him go. So advanced directives are important, but they're not really the whole story. And I think we all know this sort of intuitively that no form or checkbox will really ever eliminate the uncertainty and the complexity of the human condition, but we keep trying. We keep trying to put people in those check boxes. And again, that's why getting back to this idea of stories. So we know that we need ongoing discussions, but what do we sort of talk about and how does this work? So we know that for patients who have terminal cancer and you have an end of life or goals of care discussion, that this results in less intensive care at the end of life. There was a study that was done in Australia looking at uh, in patients who were over 80 who were near the end of their life and they had these discussions, they had more documented wishes, they were more likely to have a documented surrogate, more likely to have their wishes followed, less family stress, anxiety, and depression. So that's all great from having these discussions. But if we go back to my sort of conceptualization, and I'm not talking about the end of life, I'm trying to pull it forward, what do we talk about? So for terminal patients who are not ready, are you just going to jump in and start talking about CPR? Or what about for non-terminal patients that have chronic illness, and we know that we sort of want to get them to start thinking about this. Do we talk about life-sustaining treatments, or do we talk about something else? So how do we prepare people for these discussions and some of the decisions that may be coming up for them? <clears throat> So I just want to touch briefly on problems with the traditional approach to advanced care planning. And some of the problems really focus on three things, prediction, adaptation, and extrapolation. So in terms of prediction, I like to ask, do you know what you want for dinner next Tuesday night? I guess we could say next Monday night. Um, and you might say, well, I'm a vegan, and I know that I don't want meat, and I don't want dairy. But you know, it really sort of depends, right? Like, 
what do the kids want? What do I feel like? What's going on with work? And I think it's kind of the same thing that we may not know whether we want to have a breathing machine one, two, or 10 years from now. How do you know that when you don't even know what you want for dinner? And I would say this is the interesting thing. There have been so many sociologic and anthropo anthropologic studies that have shown that people can't predict what they're going to order for dinner at a restaurant or buy at a store 30 minutes later, much less the exact care that they want next week much less years sort of in the future. And that's because these predictions really don't reflect one's current medical, emotional, or social context. Um, and we also know that people change their mind all the time. This is a human condition. And studies show that people change their mind when their health is stable. People change their mind when their health changes. It sort of changes all the time. So, and then there's a lot of uncertainty, and I think this is about hypothetical scenarios or predicting what you may want. You know, a lot of times in these advanced directives, it's like if you were to be in a coma or if these things were to happen. And we actually gave people some of those very unambiguous hypothetical situations, and then we gave them that easy to read advanced directive, had them make a choice, and then we asked them basically how sure they were. And 50% of diverse older adults who reported a treatment preference based on a hypothetical scenario were uncertain about their decision. These were elderly adults with chronic illness who should be doing advanced care planning. So uncertainty was associated with lower literacy and lower education, minority status, but also poor health. And that was sort of interesting to us because I think there's this, this idea that if somebody's really sick, then they'll know what they want. And actually, these people who were very sick were very uncertain about the choices they were making on an easy-to-read advanced directive. And I think we need to sort of think about that and what do those forms mean when we're carrying those decisions forward um, in the future. So I don't think people know how they're going to feel until they're faced with a situation. They may have all kinds of theoretical ideas or something they read in Dear Abby, but when the time comes, you may be very surprised at your own reaction to something. I mean, it's not as easy as black and white. There are so many gray areas. So what about adaptation? So people will say that there's no way that they may be able to cope with disability, but they can. So people will say, if I were bed bound, if I were in a nursing home, if I had an amputation, that's it, pull the plug. But study after study shows that people get into these situations and actually report good quality of life. And some of them report still wanting aggressive treatments and changing their mind. Um, so we are adaptable creatures, and what does that mean sort of for future care? Um, and then that sort of bleeds into this problem with extrapolation. So sometimes there are value statements that can be too general. So on some forms, I've seen things like, I want to maintain my dignity or be free from pain. And does that mean I start dialysis or not? Or what, what does that mean? And even when you have treatment preferences that are very specific, they can be hard to extrapolate. So a lot of these advanced directives will say to forgo treatment if something is irreversible or terminal. And I'll tell you, as a physician, it's hard for me to know that. So for example, I have a patient who has CHF who's been hospitalized 10 times in the last year despite all my best efforts. And every time he comes in and he goes to the ICU, he's been intubated multiple times. And every time they have the conversation with the family that this is it, and every time it's not. So how do you really know it's really that time? And then I think the other thing that's important is extrapolating sort of these decisions about life-sustaining treatment to less evasive things. So just because you don't want CPR, does that mean that you don't want surgery or chemotherapy or to go to a nursing home? And how do you make those decisions? Um, and people may need to change their decisions in the light of unseen clinical circumstances. So again, I'll tell you a story. So there was a woman who had cancer. She said that she wanted to never, you know, she didn't want to be intubated. She got chemotherapy. That chemotherapy gave her heart failure. She wound up having to come into the emergency room for heart failure, and they transferred her to the ICU, and there was sort of this dicey moment where they were thinking that they might have to intubate her for her heart failure, not for her cancer. And the doctors felt like they really could reverse this and send her home. She didn't need to be intubated, but she actually reversed her code status and actually, they were able to treat her heart failure, and she went home and had a good quality of life with her family for the next couple of months. That's a completely unforeseen clinical circumstance, and I think it's something to, to think about. 
So nothing is written in stone, and you can't know to say, well, this is what I want. Do not resuscitate. But then the situation at hand can be totally different to where you do or don't have a chance at them resuscitating you. So some people say, well, why don't you just designate a surrogate decision maker and just be done with it? Um, but I think as we've talked about and studies have shown that surrogates often don't know they were chosen. Um, the knowledge of preferences can be no better than chance. Studies are showing that there is extreme PTSD and stress and anxiety for family members who have to make decisions um, in these situations. And then surrogates often use their own hopes, desires, and needs. Um, and this is where I like to tell the story about my grandparents. So this is a picture of them on their wedding day um, in the early 1940s. And my grandfather had, you know, I think almost every organ system was down uh, sort of in his last year of life. And he, the day after Christmas, he fell and he broke his hip and he went into the hospital and they pinned his hip. He was, you know, there for three days. And then they sent him to a nursing home. And what nobody failed to realize is that he was diabetic and they immobilized him for three days. And on day, post-op day number, I think it was four, his geriatrician finally saw him in the nursing home. And by that time he had stage four decubitus ulcer to bone in both of his heels and he never walked again. And he spent the last six months of his life going back and forth to the hospital, having heart attacks, needing, you know, they almost put him in you know, dialysis. Like it was just this horrible downward spiral. And nobody was having a goals of care conversation with him. And I didn't want to, but I felt like somebody needed to. And so I did. And he was very, very clear. He said, you know what, I'm tired. I'm not afraid of dying. So many people in my family have died and I've seen terrible things happen. No breathing tubes, no shocks, no pushing in my chest. When it's my time, please just let me go. And my grandmother was sitting there. She had heard the whole thing. She was teary eyed. And I turned to her and I said, did you hear what grandpa just said? And she said, yes. And I said, well, what are you gonna tell the doctors to do if grandpa's heart were to stop or he were to stop breathing? And she said, well, of course I'd tell the doctors to do everything possible to keep my husband alive. Are you crazy? Of course I'd say that. And I thought, was I the only person in the room having this conversation? But we'll get back to sort of this um, story. So then the question is, why do anything in advance? What, what can we do? Um, and I think the thing is, is that you know, clinicians really, we can't make recommendations or guide patients um, without knowing what their values and needs are. And unfortunately for the patients, that really can kind of only come from them um, or their family members. It's highly individual. And a lot of these people are meeting you for the first time. Um, and without preparation, patients and surrogates may not be able to communicate their values effectively, again, if there's stress and sort of no prior relationship with their doctors. That's sort of a tall order for us to expect of patients. So now I want to talk about an alternative objective of advanced care planning that focuses on preparation for decision making. So Terry Fried and I spent a long time trying to figure out what is that missing puzzle piece of advanced care planning. And we published this thought piece in the Annals of Internal Medicine, really calling for not only focusing on life-sustaining treatment, but really trying to prepare people for communication and decision-making, which they and their family members are going to have to do. So this really shifts the focus away from only asking people to make treatment decisions on an advanced directive or pulsed, and seeks to prepare people with skills to identify what's most important to them, right? That's evolving over time, to communicate with surrogates and providers effectively, and to make informed decisions based on their own values. And if you think about it, advanced directives really then should be a marker of full preparation and reflect these discussions over time. So how should patients prepare? So I'm gonna start by talking about three steps. Again, these three steps are in that Annals of Internal Medicine paper, so if you ever wanna go back, you can sort of look at those. I'm gonna first talk about the content, and then I'm gonna come back and talk about how you can actually do it um, yourselves. So in terms of the content, choosing a surrogate and asking the surrogate, clarifying values about the outcome of treatment, and establishing leeway um, in surrogate decision-making. 
So clarifying values about the outcome of treatment, and I think this is probably one of the most important, if you were asleep, this is probably the, one of the most important things I want to say. Um, you know, and what matters most to patients, and I, you know, show this sign, sort of like, why won't this thing go? There's a cart sort of before the horse. And what matters most to patients is not the treatment, but it's the outcome of treatment. And actually, Ken, one of your studies actually is referenced here because you've done work actually showing this. Um, people want to know what their life's going to be like. So it's not intubation or CPR, what I call the cart, but again, how their life will be after the treatment, which is the horse. And one of the things that I think that we sort of mess up often with patients is we start with the cart. We start with asking people if they want CPR or mechanical ventilation before we actually find out what their story is and who they are and how they want to live their life. So are we reviving him, sticking the tube in so that he can suffer more? I guess it goes back to what happens if you revive him. Is he going through that whole process again? It's the end result. So, and we've also shown that prior stories really can help people frame their medical decisions. So um, we actually did a study, so way back in the day when we were doing our randomized control trial of that advanced directive was during the time when Terry Schiavo was all over the news. And for those of you who don't remember, she was a young woman in a persistent vegetative state and there was a huge sort of media uh, frenzy that, you know, this was all the way up to the Supreme Court about whether or not they were going to remove her feeding tube. So we sort of capitalized on that, and we asked our patients in our trial if they had heard about her story. And actually, 92% of our English and Spanish-speaking older adults at our county hospital had actually heard of her story. But more importantly, due to the case and the media coverage, 61% had clarified their own values and goals for medical care. And of those, 66% spoke to their family about their goals, but only 8% spoke to their doctor, which is a missed opportunity. So just to say that these stories, whether it happens to them or their family members or they see it on the news, can be used to help people identify their own values. Um, and I'll come back to that. So reflecting on changes. So helping patients reflect on whether they're changing or adapting to serious illness and studies have shown to help people better predict their preferences in the future. So as they progress along their disease trajectory, these discussions can become more specific. You can use their own story. So when you were in the hospital with heart failure, when you were in the ICU and you were intubated, tell me that story. Tell me how that went for you. Tell me if it would be worth it again. Um, and then choosing a surrogate and asking the surrogate, establishing leeway and surrogate decision making. Again, still talking about the content or why are these things important. So surrogates need preparation. So I think the scary statistic is that anywhere between 50 to 76% of us in this room will be unable to participate in some of our, all of our medical decisions at the end of life, meaning we may need somebody to help us. And surrogates report being unprepared to make medical decisions, never being asked, and not knowing their role. The process is highly stressful, and it's difficult if they have no sense about what somebody wants, but more importantly, why somebody wanted it. How many people do you here do palliative care consults? In the hospital, how many times do you go to the ICU and then somebody's just looking at you like a deer in headlights because they never knew they were going to be in that position? Like, it happens all the time. So the only thing I managed to talk to my father about was if anything should happen and his heart should stop. That was the extent of how much I knew what his wishes were. The other stuff we were guessing at is Chino, whether he would want to be home or on hospice. <coughs> so surrogates may need to make decisions that conflict with patients' preferences. So I can tell you as a geriatrician, this happens a lot. Somebody's wish to die at home and the only person that can care for them is their 90 pound spouse who cannot pick them up from the bed or take care of them. Um, or somebody who's asked to withdraw care or may benefit from transient treatment. Again, they've written something in the advanced directive but something else is actually in their best interest. And that puts surrogates in a very hard spot. So surrogate burden may be eased by giving them uh, permission to consider factors other than prior wishes on a document that may have been filled out many years ago during in-the-moment decision-making, and that's a concept called leeway. 
So what the heck is leeway? Um, this is actually, I found out, was a nautical term. Um, leeway refers to the way a sailing vessel can drift sideways even while it's moving forward. I sort of feel like that's a metaphor for my own life. Um, but I think oftentimes what winds up happening when we're having these conversations with people over time. Um, and studies have been done on leeway way back in the 90s um, in patients who were on dialysis. They asked people, how much leeway should your physician and surrogate have to override this advance directive if it were in your best interest? Now, about 40% said no leeway, but 60% either said a little, a lot, or complete leeway. And when you think about it from an ethical perspective, if you do it ahead of time and you actually have this conversation, it's still an extension of the patient's autonomy because they're allowing their loved one, they're giving them permission to have leeway. And this sort of gets back to my grandparents. So when this happened, remember my grandfather said, natural death, let me go. And my grandmother said, what are you talking about? I tell the doctors to do everything possible. And I turned to my grandfather because at the time I was thinking, this is the worst person to be his surrogate decision maker. She's not going to honor his wishes. This is terrible. And I turned to him and I said, did you hear what grandma just said? And he said, yes. And he said, I'm ready to go, but if it helps your grandmother to feel that she did everything possible for me, even if it's because she doesn't want me to go, that is okay. She's the one who has to go on living with her decision. If this is what she wants, then this is what I want, because I love her. And I was really angry at the time. I did not understand this, but I'll tell you that my grandmother wound up holding to her guns. My grandfather was full code. He coded in the nursing home at three o'clock in the morning. They coded him for 10 minutes. He never regained consciousness. My grandmother still feels like she did the best that she could for him, and she trusts the medical system in a way that she didn't before, for whatever that's worth. And I just want to let people know that the concept of leeway is actually on some of these advanced directive forms. So it's on our easy to read advanced directive form. It's on the VA advanced directive form, and it, it's becoming more common, you may see it. Um, okay, so let's talk about nitty gritty. How do we actually do this? Um, so how to make it easier for you guys. So I think one of the things that I talk about with trainees is leaving sort of their agenda at the door. And what I mean by that is I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a palliative care consult where the request is, could you please make this person DNR, DNI? <laughs> which is not really my job, but you know, I think that a lot of times trainees go in and feel like they have to get something from the patient or their attending's gonna be upset if they didn't get the right answer. And I have to tell you, all of us would feel like we know when somebody's trying to sell us something, a used car, right? Um, it feels different. Um, and so I think that we can help ourselves by just leaving our agenda at the door. And the way that I look at it is that we're information gatherers and translators. So our job is to match people's treatments with preferences and values. And I put this sign up here about Google Translate with conversation mode. And I feel like if Google can do it automatically, then we should be able to do it sort of for our patients. Um, so the three steps, again, these are the same steps as before. They're in that annals paper, but how do you do it? So choose a surrogate and ask a surrogate. Clarify values about the outcome of treatment, again, how their life will be, not just about CPR. Reassess over time for changes in wishes and establish leeway in surrogate decision making, permission to change prior decisions. Um, and looking at the time, I may just sort of choose some choice things here as we move forward. Um, but choosing a surrogate and asking the surrogate. Um, this is important because sometimes these are the only questions that I ask and I get all the information that I need. So instead of going in and like, oh, if your heart were to stop and should we do chest compressions, sometimes I just ask these questions and it's all there. So is there anyone you trust to make medical decisions for you? Does this person know that you chose him or her for this role? And then what have you talked about? And if they say we haven't talked, well, what would you talk about? And sometimes that's it, that's all you have to say. And I have to say, even in my geriatric outpatient clinic, I have started asking the surrogates, are you willing to make medical decisions for this person? I will pick up the phone and I will call them in, that, um, in my primary care clinic. And I can tell you that I've had more than a handful of surrogates say, uh-uh, 
I am not going to do that. And you know what? Better to find out now than when there's some crisis because it allows us to find a better alternative surrogate decision maker. Clarifying values about the outcome of treatment, so how their life will be not just about CPR and reassessing this sort of over time for changes. Um, so, and again, all of uh, many of you here in this audience are experts, so I don't need to tell you this, but you know, I'd like to get to know you as a person, what brings your life meaning, what brings you joy, how do you define a good quality of life, what would not be considered good quality of life to you? And starting from there, you get to kind of know them as a person and, and sort of the things that would be uh, important to them. Um, Again, here are some questions that I feel like oftentimes don't get asked, and this is sometimes all I need to ask. Have you filled out an advanced directive or a living will? What did you write down? Do you still feel the same way? If they know what it is, and I've seen this like, oh yeah, my doctor gave that to me, but I never filled it out. Well, have you thought about what you might write down and kind of talk to me about that? And usually you get like a whole story about that. Um, so again, make, make life easier on yourself and sort of start some at, at some of these places. Um, this has been incredibly helpful, this first one. Have you seen someone on television, had someone close to you, or had your own experience with serious illness or death? What went well, what did not go well, and why? And then if you were in this situation, what would you hope for? What would you be worried about? What would you consider worst case scenario? Would it be worth it to you again? So for some patients who cannot go there, so I had a patient who had metastatic prostate cancer, and I tried for years to have this conversation with him. I do you know, research on advanced care planning, and I was like, I can't, I can't get this guy to talk to me. And I had set up special appointments just to have the conversation. I brought out the easy to read advanced directive every time I saw him. I made special social work appointments. Nothing worked, he would not have this conversation with me. And then it sort of came up in our conversation that about six months earlier, his brother had died in the ICU from complications of metastatic prostate cancer. And all I said was, well, can you tell me that story? What was that like? What did you think about that? How did that make you feel? You know, when you think about yourself, like, you know, how, are there things that you thought went well or what didn't go well? And he told me everything that I needed to know. And we actually filled out his advance directive, like, at that meeting. He couldn't talk about himself, but he could tell me a story about somebody else. And that's been really powerful. So, and I also kind of like this spectrum thing, um, where I actually literally use my hands as a spectrum. And I will say, some people say, you know, that people are on a spectrum, some people are way over here, and some people will say that life is always worth living no matter how much pain they may be in or no matter what's going on. And some people are way over here and feel completely differently. Where are you sort of on this spectrum? And I have yet to have a patient who can't say, I'm kind of there, I'm a little bit there, or I'm all the way over there. And I'm not asking them about CPR, mechanical ventilation, I'm asking them about sort of, and I'm, I'm normalizing that it is a spectrum and it's okay to have a spectrum. Um, and I feel like this has been really helpful. And then I think this gets back to us being translators. So based on what you told me about what brings your life meeting, what you wrote in your advance directive, how you felt about your loved one's experience, how you felt about your last hospitalizations, the things that would be worse than death, it sounds as though X may be something that you would or would not want for yourself. Is that, is that true? And they can always say, no, you totally missed the boat, but they're also hearing that you're listening to them and their story and what's important to them. And then establishing leeway and surrogate decision making. Um, I'm gonna just breeze through this really quickly just to, it's important to kind of let people know. And again, all of this, wor this wording is in that annals paper, um, but kind of breaking it down. So is it okay to use your medical wishes as a general guide? So this means that your loved one would do their best to follow your wishes, but it would be okay to change your decisions if your doctor think, thinks that something else is best for you. Do you want limited leeway? Like everything's great except this one thing, I don't want a blood transfusion. Or you know what, my children cannot pull the plug, so do not let them change any of my decisions that I'm making now. Um, so those are the three steps for clinicians. Choose a surrogate, clarify values, and establish leeway. And now I wanna talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing to try to help patients and surrogates. 
So in terms of unmet need, we know that 43 million uh, adults in the U.S. who are over the age of 65, um, right, or over 65 right now, and that's going to increase to 80 million um, in the year 2050. Um, 70 percent of those have more than one illness, and 14 million are hospitalized every year. So this means that millions of people are making millions of decisions all the time about complex medical care. And if you had to make tough decisions for yourself or for someone else, you know, what would you hope for? You might hope that you have a clinician who has the time and training to have these great conversations with you, but you might also hope that you have some sort of a framework that you can fall back on to identify what's most important to you to be able to learn how to communicate with other people about that and to make informed medical decisions. So the major communication deficits that I see, especially for disenfranchised populations that I work with, are that patients are not empowered to speak up for themselves, especially if they're sick and scared. And this lack of guidance really translates to surrogates who then just really don't know what to do. And we know that sort of, you know, if people are unprepared, they make uninformed choices. They often get care that's not consistent with their goals. Again, we've talked about stress and PTSD, both for patients and surrogates, and this actually leads to increased healthcare expenditures because people actually are not getting the care that they actually want. So I'm gonna breeze through this stuff um, and just tell you that the solution that we came up with was this interactive multimedia website called Prepare. Um, it's found at prepareforyourcare.org. It's in English and in Spanish. And there are five steps to prepare, and you will see that this is very similar to those three steps that we were talking about for clinicians with a few added things in there. Choose a medical decision maker and choose the right one. Decide what matters most in your life. Choose flexibility or leeway for your decision maker. How do you actually tell others about your wishes? That's kind of a hard thing to do. And then how do you ask doctors the right questions so that you're making the right decision for yourself? Um, I will just breeze through this really quickly, just tell you that this is based on a lot of theory about behavior change and social cognitive theory. Um, but more importantly, we actually convened an expert panel when we were developing the website of experts in health literacy, geriatrics, palliative care, and behavior change. You've seen some of these quotes from the 13 focus groups that we had for patients and surrogates, and we did extensive cognitive interviews, and for people that don't know what that is, it's like a talk out loud, what does this look like, how does this storyboard look, do you like this picture, do you like this color? It's exhausting, um, but it's really important. Um, but really, the key sort of cornerstone of the website are these videos that model behavior, Getting back to that social cognitive behavioral theory, we don't just say this is important and you should do it. We actually show people how to do it. Um, we wanted to make sure it was easy to understand, so it's written at a fifth grade reading level in large font. There's voiceovers of text in case somebody has a literacy problem, and there's closed captioning in case somebody is hearing impaired. Um, and we really went out of our way to balance the content of the videos the best we could on our you know, shoestring budget. But you know, in terms of our actors, we tried to balance the race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, this was interesting. We really had to be very careful about balancing the stories about aggressive care versus comfort care. And people who wanted comfort care for themselves were not threatened by stories about people who wanted aggressive care. But people who very much wanted aggressive care for themselves were very threatened by stories about people who wanted comfort care. And we had to be very careful to balance that. We have found in our studies that anywhere between 15 to 20 percent, especially at our disenfranchised groups, will report that they don't have one person to make medical decisions for them. So we had to tailor the content for them. And in San Francisco, we're in a very diverse part of the country, and there are many patients who have different views on autonomy and may not want to be involved in their own medical decision making. So we had to tailor content for that also. Um, so, in terms of if you go to the website, if you were just to click, say, on step one, again, you can see this comes back to stories to try to help people learn this. So, these are story, you know, click the pictures to see who these people chose as their decision maker. So, Cynthia chose her husband, Jorge chose his family, Helen may choose a neighbor. And then we really get to the how. So, how do you do it? How do you ask somebody to be your decision maker? 
we actually give them words that they could use if it's too hard, there's too much activation energy to do it, or someone could just sit next to them while they're watching the website and they can just kind of ask them that way. Um, how do they overcome barriers? So these were common barriers that came up in our focus groups and people can click on them if they think it's gonna be too scary or they don't know how to sort of engage. How do you tell others about your wishes? How do you ask doctors the right questions? And then again, as people are going through these five steps, the site actually asks people about their wishes and goals. Um, and we've recently added sort of open-ended um, sections too, so people can actually write down why they feel that way. Um, and at the end, we ask people to make an action plan. Um, and by that I mean sort of a mini contract to do something. It could be as small as just thinking about who they want their decision maker to be. Um, and then that prints out a summary of their wishes that has their action plan. It has all of the things that they've decided. Um, and the idea is that this is really to be used to spark discussions with their family and friends and their clinicians. This is written at a fifth grade reading level, has large font, and we were finding that people were bringing this in um, to their physician, it was being scanned into the medical record, so we felt like we needed to do something a little bit more, um, I don't know, it looked official, and actually had for the medical provider on here. Um, so that's in, involved too. And then when people are ready to complete advanced directives, there's sort of a guide for how you can do that. And I'll just tell you that there's some exciting sort of things about this um, in a moment. Um, so we actually did a pilot study and found that PREPARE actually does improve patient engagement in advanced care planning. We actually went to low-income senior centers and patients in this pilot were 70 years of age. And I will say that 92% of them had never used a computer before. And these were chronically ill older adults. And I can tell you that only 40% of them had engaged in some form of advanced care planning. But one week after viewing prepared, that went up to 100%. And again, for these very computer naive individuals, they rated prepare a nine out of 10 for ease of use. So we were happy about that. Um, we are in the middle of three randomized control trials right now um, among veterans um, and English and Spanish speakers at our county hospital. As I said, I've gotten some funding from the California Healthcare Foundation to translate, uh, prepare into Spanish. We're moving on to Mandarin and Cantonese as we slowly get some funding. Um, and what's really cool, so excited, I've been wanting to do this for 10 years, I just got funding from uh, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation to use our advanced or easy to read advanced care planning or advanced directives, work with our colleagues at UC Hastings and update these forms for all 50 states. So it'll be the first easy to read, fifth grade reading level form that can be used in all these states in English and Spanish. But also part of that is to integrate the advanced directive right into prepare. So at the end, if they're ready to do it, all of those values and wishes can be in a legal form. So not only do you get the checkbox, you get all of the reasons why, stories about themselves into sort of one form. Um, we have a new partnership, which is really exciting. So um, we have a license agreement with Optum Care, where we're pilot testing prepare among Medicaid Advantage patients. And what's cool is we've worked on this new functionality for prepare, where we can white label the content. So Optum, you know, looks like Optum's website. But the cool thing is that we have data reporting. So in terms of a population of patients, you know, you can know who's going to the site, what are their wishes and values, and we're working on ways to sort of integrate this back into the EMR and get it back to the point of care. So I'm just going to end here by a little bit by talking about documentation because this is sort of the, one of the things that is just, I think, so important and it really gets back sort of to those stories. Um, and I call it sort of getting the full story um, in our documentation. So I sort of doc, you know, equate the full code or DNR DNI is similar to if somebody just wrote in the chart XLAP. For people who don't know, it's exploratory laparotomy. Can you imagine if a patient showed up in the ICU and the only thing that was written in their chart was exploratory laparotomy? You would be asking yourself, well, why? What's the indication? What did you find? Is the patient stable? Are they competent? What are the next steps in their care? Right? That's a no-brainer. 
but we write full code, DNR, DNI. I have no idea if you copied and pasted it from prior note. I have no idea if this represents a new conversation. I have no idea why that person chose that. And your colleagues, who are the next person to take on that patient, have no idea what to do, what's the next step in that conversation. So again, it's not just DNR, DNI, or full code. And I know I'm speaking to the choir with sort of this group. Um, and I think it's really important that we document patient stories. Um, and so I'm just going to tell you another story. This is the last story of the night about this. Um, but I had a patient um, who was a very frail 93-year-old Filipino man, and a rapid response was called um, in the hospital for end-stage CHF. So he was found unresponsive, his O2 was failing, BiPAP was failing, and they felt like they needed to transfer him to the ICU, and it was very highly likely that he might need to be intubated. He, his advanced director on the chart said full code. So there is a resident in the ICU who gets this person who literally, when I say weighs 90 pounds and is just skin and bones, who looks like they're not going to make it through the night, and this is all that person knows, and their family shows up and, and the resident doesn't know what to do, and then the resident read my note. And my note basically said that Mr. D had been DNR, DNI for years until he learned that his petition to bring his children from the Philippines would die when he dies. He had one successful cardioversion for AFib with RVR and has been on BiPAP. He's willing to try CPR and mechanical ventilation for a chance of living longer, but only for a few days. He does not want to live on machines. If he cannot wake up, talk to or recognize his family or get out of bed, life would not be worth living. It was okay for his daughter, who's a DPOA, to have leeway, even to change his advanced directive, but he hopes that she'll know that it is okay to stop the machines if he's suffering. Now, did it make that evening any easier on the family? No. Did they still have to have a very hard conversation? They absolutely did, but he was able to read my note to the family members, and it made that a lot easier. So... With that, like I said, that was my last story, and I will end there. Um, we have a new sort of newsletter and mailing list, so if you're interested, you can email Jana Powell, and we will get you on our mailing list for upcoming events. So thank you. If, um, if you don't need to leave for the Warriors game, it um, looks like we do have a few minutes for questions. Hi, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned best interests a number of times during your speech, and it's something I always struggle with, really defining what does best interest mean. At one point you're saying that the advanced care directive may conflict with someone's best interest. So I'm just curious what you mean when you say best interest, and if there is any difference you're going to talk about, say best interest, versus what we may feel a reasonable person may want right. compared to what this person put on their advanced directive. Right. Um, so there's a bioethicist here. Maybe you would like to feel that, that conversation. <laughs> um, you know, I'm... <laughs> actually You know, I mean, I'm on the ethics committee at the VA, and I think this comes up a lot, right? Um, and I think that it's not really an issue or problem until it's an issue or problem, right? So if somebody's DNR, DNI... <laughs> And we agree with that, nobody questions it, right? And if somebody's a full code and then we question it, that's where sort of these things wind up coming, coming up. So I think um, uh, best interest is, can be interpreted, as you know, if you're a bioethicist. And I think that whenever there's conflict, um, you know, I, I don't think people should be making these decisions alone. Yeah, and I think for the surrogate, when you think about it, um, you know, again, these things come, I'm sure you guys, this is, you know, these are the ethics consults that you get, right? That maybe the surrogate wants to do something that you feel is not in the best interest of the patient, but they do. And oftentimes, like my grandmother, I did not feel like that was in my grandfather's best interest, but she did. And like having these conversations over time in a non-adversarial way can sort of eventually lead to figuring out what is the best interest. But I think it takes some some sleuthing work to figure out who that person is 
and sort of what's going on with the medical team. But that could be like a whole hour long talk, I think. You can ask me back for that one. <laughs> Hi, my question has to do with the new forms that you're do dealing with. Do they uh, authorize the surrogate to make decisions about the what to do with the body? Because that's the singular benefit of the ugly California one. Yeah. Everything's vested in the one bloke where five wishes and all of that doesn't do yeah. that. Yeah, so the new forms, so we just updated these forms, I want to say two months ago, and there is a little form so that it can extend, you know, to, to the, basically, we don't say it this way, but disposition of somebody's remains. Cool, thank you. Line. Yeah. First of all, I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, to, as, as someone who's been interested in this field for a long time, I want to thank you. Uh, for taking something that uh, an area where for years advanced care planning didn't make a difference uh, and um, turning it into something that is evidence-based, conceptually driven, where it is highly likely to make a difference moving forward. So you deserve a tremendous amount of credit for that. Thanks. And it's incredibly hard work. Um, and then uh, also a question. Um, you know, one of the things that I was struck by during your talk was how the people who have been um, role models for me as I've gone through my own professional career and who have done this come, come to the same solutions as far as the language that they use um, in terms of framing the discussions. Mm -hmm. um, and I also am struck by that it seems like the decision making nowadays is much harder than it needs to be because for many of the decisions they're on foregone conclusions where someone is dying really soon mm -hmm. and that the discussions are really around the margins and I'm curious what your thoughts are about uh, the interface between framing these very important conversations and specific questions, and then maybe trying to move things away from decisions around the margins, but to decisions around things that are just more basic. Um, I, don't, yeah, I don't know if I, that makes sense. Well, I don't know, getting back to a story, yes. I don't know if the story will answer your question, but um, it's about my grandmother. So fast forward you know, to her, sort of what's going on in her life. And all of her doctors have been asking her, you know, she is very, she's 98 years old. She's, you know, in and out of the hospital. She's very frail. And they keep having these conversations with her about CPR, mechanical ventilation. And she wanted to be full code. And the, the, she kept saying, well, the reason I want to be full code is because I want my sons to be able to come to my bedside and say goodbye. I don't want to die alone. It's okay for them to pull the plug, but I want to wait. And sort of like you said, that's kind of like a margin decision. And I just asked her, I said, can you describe to me what your end of life looks like? If a perfect world, what does it look like? And she said, oh, well, if I were to get sick, the doctors would do CPR, and then they would put me in a hospital bed, and I would just wait until my sons came, and then they would come, and they would bring me some cake, and we would sit around, and we would reminisce, and then they would both kiss me on my cheek, and then I would go to sleep. And then, you know, so then we were, having to, we were able to have a conversation about what was really important to her is her family and her sons and her sons being there and her not wanting to die alone, and we could have a completely different conversation. So I don't know if that answered your no, it's, question. It's a, it's a great question. I, and I'm just going to add on saying that, that my own communications have evolved over time because I realize that, that a lot of patients' preferences are driven by unrealistic expectations of what is the, this going to be like. And so now I've, I've gotten to the point where I say, some people say, regardless of the situation, they want to fight for every last minute even if it means they're going to die on machines and less comfortably mm -hmm. than they could. 
Other people say, yes, I want to live as long as I can, and I want the doctors to help me. But if it gets to that very close time, right. I'm willing to sacrifice extra hours or days if I can be more comfortable and at peace. And the, the, the framing has changed people's responses. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I struggle with this issue that I, I'm wondering if we're still at a place where the framing of these discussions are still focused on the margins rather than on the bigger margins. Well, I think, you know, getting back to that, you know, focusing on the treatment and not the outcome of treatment, that's sort of exactly what you're talking about. When we start with, do you want dialysis? Do you want a feeding tube? Do you want CPR? Those aren't the right questions. You know, starting with how do you want to live your life and what do you see, you know, what's important to you sort of are the, the places to start. Um, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, so I think probably one of the biggest limitations that, you know, we as residents and obviously as, as practicing physicians and PCPs and geriatricians have is time. Um, and I think we all would love to listen to our patients' stories if we had enough time. Um, and we probably should still, even if we don't have enough time, try to listen to our patients' stories. Um, I guess from a logistical standpoint, you know, you were talking about how you would schedule separate appointments to talk about advanced care planning, and I think that's a great idea. Logistically speaking, um, how, how often can you yeah. bill for that? Yeah. You know, can you do that once a month until you have the full story? or? Yeah, so that is a great question. And I would say that the, the reason that we made prepare the way that it is and the reason I sort of chunked down the things for clinicians in like three steps is that you, you don't have to do them all at the same time. Um, you know, and especially for patients, if this is overwhelming, they can go home and do step one and you can talk about them. So I, you know, I've sort of had it down to a science now in my geriatric clinic, um, to be honest, and I think my patients are just sick and tired of talking to me about it. But, you know, I, like every time somebody comes to talk to, every single time they come in, I actually read them the narrative that I've written for them. And they'll be like, yes, Dr. Sidori, that's exactly what I think. Or they'll say like, you know what? My brother died last month and that's not my surrogate anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? But I can kind of add on and chunk on over time. You start with the surrogate. And like I said, sometimes that's the only question you ask and you get all the information that you need. So I don't think it has to be a 45 minute conversation. And I would say that these conversations are different in the outpatient setting than in the inpatient setting. So a lot of the things that I'm doing are what can you do in the outpatient setting sort of upstream or when you're meeting that person in the hospital who's like freaked out and can't even start having these conversations. Um, so I think there's a, there's a little distinction between those two settings and, and those patients. But you know, um, there's you know, the new CMS sort of reimbursement for advanced care planning is very exciting because the way that they wrote it you could get reimbursed for advanced care planning every time the person comes in. Now, the thing to know about that, which I just learned, is that your patient won't have to pay a copay the first time, but they have to pay a copay after that. But that being said, you can still bill. It's not like you can only do it once and, and sort of that's it. And that's on the outpatient side. Um, but I think that there are ways, and again, this is making it easier for us. Sometimes we feel like we have to have the whole conversation at one time. Even if you're on the inpatient service, you're not going to have a full conversation the first time you meet someone. And we feel this like we've got to get everything done in one time. But I think people don't process that way. I think it actually makes us inefficient. Um, and you can kind of shorten your time by doing it in, in blocks. I can tell you want to say something. Well, there <laughs> There's an interesting program coming from uh, Harvard and the Brigham um, called Talking About Serious Illness mm -hmm. that has really come up with a, a checklist, checklist, kind of a la Atul Gawande, for having the conversation, particularly in the outpatient setting by a primary care provider. And their work is pretty exciting as well because it's, it's a guided conversation. Right. And you can do it in 20 minutes or less. And, and the other thing is maybe you just do one of the things on the checklist, but you did something. And so it doesn't, I think for us, again, making it easier, it doesn't have to be so overwhelming. 
I thank you very much. It is a wonderful presentation. Um, I deal with elderly individuals and their families. So when I got the notice about this, I went to your website. It is great. I only spent about 15 minutes. I was totally convinced. Um, so I want to know, uh, can I share this with tons of people? Um, yes. So, so the, and, and you know, I would say, please feel free to, to contact me because I'm trying to figure this out for ourselves right now. This has been this ongoing thing. It was my, always my intent to ensure it and make it free for the public. And that's what we've done. Um, we've tried to figure out ways that insurers or healthcare systems would also like to sort of buy onto it, especially for the data piece, to kind of keep it sustainable. So right now, and, and I have to say, it is so, I mean, as I like to say, I, I went into medicine and not business for a reason, because I just hate all of that stuff. So right now, you can send anybody to it. You can let people know about the site. It's free to the public. It's been free for the last three years. And if anybody has any ideas about a sustainable model to kind of be able to keep it that way, Please let me know. Um, one, uh, I think I was telling Shoshana here that one of the things that's exciting about the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation grant is they're allowing me to kind of pull together an advisory committee to help us sort of figure these things out. So what we have so far is if, if individual people are going to the website, it's totally fine. If it's sort of like, here's our health care center's advanced care planning program, and it's about prepare, then just for legal reasons, we need a license agreement, um, if that answers your question. And we just include it in suggestions yeah, for patients? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that would be what we do. Absolutely. And one other last item, I, I, as I said, I spent about 15 minutes. Did you address in any of your vignettes the more challenging discussion in some of the Asian families? Yeah, so that actually Surrogates. came up quite a bit in our focus groups, um, specifically uh, individuals who actually, you know, defer to their family members to make decisions or someone who doesn't want to know about their prognosis. Um, so a lot of those things actually came out pretty strong. And, and we pulled, you know, the stories that you see on the website came straight from our focus groups um, so that we did include some of those. Yeah. So. Jennifer okay. Hi, um, I'm a hepatologist and I deal with liver cancer patients and end-stage liver patients and so we have this discussion quite a bit and I have two questions. One is that, is it enough just to have a surrogate without writing it all down and having the conversation without taking it to the next step? And then the second one comes up in the inpatient setting which is the, the leeway piece of it. Have you ever been a part of a situation where the leeway goes in the wrong direction, meaning a patient has views about if, if I can't return to my quality of life after being intubated, I wouldn't want to continue, but the patient's family uses the leeway to continue? Yeah. I mean, that's, that was my grandmother, right? Um, so the first one about is it enough to talk to the family and not write it down. I mean, I think one of the things, you know, we find in a lot of our patient populations, again, disenfranchised groups, there's no way in hell they're going to write anything down on a piece of paper. It's not going to happen. Um, so you do the best that you can, and you try to prepare the surrogate the best you can. And again, you know, as our ethical colleagues will tell us, it's not a problem until it's a problem. So if you have a surrogate and they know what your wishes are, and and the surrogate agrees with what the doctors are saying, it's never a problem. It's only a problem when it's a problem. And I think in terms of the leeway, again, you know, the reason to first of all ask the surrogate if they're willing to do it because you want to know if they're going to say no ahead of time and then have a frank discussion about what leeway means, right? And I actually, I, for one of the things, I mean, I actually think that it's very important to document leeway and what that means to the patient because they're going to end up in your ethics group, right, if the, some of these things happen and you need to kind of know. So my grandfather, I was able to ask him, like, why would you allow her to do that? And he was very clear why, right? It didn't make sense to me, but he felt very strongly about that. But you can at least document that and know so there isn't so much of this angst like, is it right or is it wrong? Because I think just saying they have leeway, it's not enough. You kind of, you need to have that discussion. But again, better to have it ahead of time than not at the end. Yeah. 
So um, I actually have a question about the disenfranchised uh, individuals. I was just curious if you have any suggestions or if you know of any, you know, um, projects or research that is being done to engage with this, you know, community of individuals who have very set and strong preferences about what they want. You know, they, they don't want to be a part of the medical system. Uh, they want to live, you know, independent lives. They want to live, you know, on the street. And yet what we see happening is that they come up, you know, they end up in our hospitals, and they end up, you know, in our ICUs, and uh, they're here for months on end, and we're struggling with conservatorship and all kinds of shenanigans, right? So I was just wondering if, if, there, if there is any kind of a research or project that is being done to engage with these individuals. You? <laughs> um, so, yeah, a, cu a couple of things. So we're... Um, we're trying to reach these marginalized patients because I think that they're the ones that are most at risk, most vulnerable for being in these situations. So whether um, you know we find them um, on the street, we have a, a grant uh, application now for homeless patients. We're working with people who get you know uh, IHSS workers in their homes, so Medicaid sort of funded that way. These are very so oftentimes very marginalized sort of individuals. Um, in our studies at San Francisco General Hospital, many of these people are, we have, especially in our Spanish-speaking community, 60% of those people have limited health literacy. Many of them are undocumented. Many of them are in this country by themselves um, and are very isolated. Um, and again, I think a lot of those those considerations were taken into when we created these materials. So how do you make them not scary? How do you not sort of cram your own agenda down somebody's throat? So if they don't want to fill something out, if they don't want to have particular conversations, they feel okay not doing that. Um, on another note, I was actually, you know, the American Thoracic Society meeting was just this last weekend. And um, last Friday, I was with a whole group of people from ethics and pulmonary and end of life trying to figure out that very question. Somebody who is homeless, unrepresented, unbefriended, shows up, no wishes, in the ICU, nobody knows what to do. And then what do you do? So it's coming, maybe in the next six months, they're putting together a white paper for that.